Okay, guys, thanks for coming. Uh, for those of you who have heard me rant about this work for a long time, I get to actually see it in person. So thank you to Eric Coel for coming. He is a postdoc at Columbia. Um, I'm going to describe as a neuroscientist, but I don't know if that's... Once a neuroscientist. Yeah, once a neuroscientist <laughs> now. He studies uh, emergence and causal relationships among things. So with that, uh, please welcome Eric Coel. But thanks everybody so much for coming out. Uh, I know this talk is really short notice, so that's why I very much appreciate it. Um, a little bit more about my background, so you understand where I'm coming from. Um, I was originally, uh, I got my PhD in neuroscience, and I worked under um, a neuroscientist named Giulio Tononi, and we were very interested in some of these uh, more almost mathematical problems of the brain, such as how does a uh, how does the cortex integrate information. And then it turns out, of course, that then suddenly you need this whole framework for, well, what is, what does it mean for information to be integrated and, and so on? And so it led us down this more uh, formal wormhole and eventually into issues of causation and information uh, that I think ended up having some very interesting consequences. And so since then, my research has been focused on, on fleshing out some of these ideas. And I think one of the, one of the, the things that this sheds light on is this issue of of emergence and reduction, which is a, a very broad topic with a very, very long history, and a lot of people mean you know, slightly different things um, when they say those words, and so hopefully you'll get a sense of, of what I mean, because I want to start off by kind of framing this, uh, this topic in a very general way, which is that if you take any system, and yeah, you can see my history of normally more used to talking to neuroscientists, um, so if you take any system, such as the brain, and you can investigate it at many different spatial temporal levels. Science does this all the time, and we can kind of take the brain as a whole, or we can zoom into some particular cortical area, like, like V1, and we can go down to V1 and ask, well, what's, what's that made of? And it's made up of these large macro columns of tens of thousands of neurons, and then each of those is made up of these mini columns of, say, 100 neurons. Oops. And then those are, of course, made up of neurons, which you might know of, and they have a particular uh, at, and they meet each other at particular synapses, and you can go down to the synapses and you can look at, say, the neurotransmitter molecules that are being exchanged, and the receptors, and then you could even dive into the molecular machinery of the synapse. And we call all of this neuroscience to a particular degree, um, but we often give uh, the different domains with, the, of, with a focus on different scales, different names, like molecular neuroscience or cognitive neuroscience or something like that. And additionally, we can kind of think then of well, if you think about science as a whole, the, a, a simplified view, but a, but a relatively true view, is that the large-scale structure of science is essentially a spatial temporal hierarchy. So what that means is that you start down at some bottom-most level. We don't know what that level is, right? It's still up in the air. And you kind of think of there being almost like a mapping between these levels. So if you start down at the bottom level, well, something that you do down there makes up port clouds. And then core clouds kind of make up atomic physics, and those make up chemical interactions, and those make up cellular structures. And then, of course, the stuff that we're familiar with in our everyday experience in life, such as intentionality, behavior, psychology, then you can go all the way up to economics and, and social sciences. And maybe a very simplistic view would be, again, that you just have this mapping, right? So I can map, I have some big, vast library of chemical structures or reactions, and I can kind of map that up into what makes up a cell, and that's how I can kind of construct my higher scale of the cell. So when I talk about scales, I'm kind of talking about this, this general ladder. And this general ladder presents kind of an immediate question, right, which is, well, since that you can always kind of keep going down in this arrow, um, you know, why don't we just say, well, all of science is essentially whatever is going on down at this fundamental level, and these are all just kind of compressed descriptions of what's going on at that fundamental level, and you could use various terms to describe this intuition. You could say, well, maybe all the causal work is being done down there on this subatomic level, or maybe that's where all the information is that you need, or that's where all the best theoretically possible models are. Um, and so I just want to talk about this in a general sense, and we can kind of say, okay, well, there's this reductive assumption, which is that the, the microscale and this is often relative, right? So if I'm a cognitive neuroscientist, maybe my microscale that I consider going down to whatever uh, the, the lowest is, is some form of molecular neuroscience, right? 
And you can say, well, the microscope does all the calls of work, it contains all the information, and therefore it's the best possible model. And we use you know, these higher levels simply because it's a practical impossibility to ever actually track, say, everything that's going on in the cell, or you just don't have sufficient sampling, and because it's convenient. And a lot rests on this assumption. Like it's in the background of a lot of stuff. Um, so, for example, in neuroscience, there's this thing called the Blue Brain Project and the Human Brain Project, which is to try and create the biggest possible and most fine grained possible uh, model of the brain down at the level of synapses. And it's like the EU gave it like a billion dollars, right? And so they're kind of operating under this micro assumption that, that we want the most complex model possible. And so, is this micro assumption always justified? And you'll notice before that I said that the scales are relative. Well, I mean, think about it, right? So why does a neuroscientist feel that they should probably stop at molecular neuroscience? They don't feel like, well, okay, let's just keep going and going and going down to chemistry and that would be truer and truer and truer for what I'm interested in. At some point, they feel like there's some sort of bottom scale. So even within our own um, scientific practice, we kind of realize, well, you know, you can't always take this as, as true. Some Philosophers have talked about this general issue. Uh, there's a philosopher named Ye Wong Kim who wrote a book called Mind and Physical World. Uh, this is a big issue in analytic philosophy, which is uh, not my field, but here's an example of something that they would talk about. They would say, um, they would say there's something called the exclusion problem. And this is like kind of one example of the, the reductive assumption, which is that, okay, I've got some physical system, and you can describe it at some fine brain micro scale and it's going through time, and here, for example, it transitions from one state to another state, and then at the same time, there's this higher level, and this higher level is a property, uh, has a property called supervenience, which means that if you fix these underlying causes, you fix these upper level causes, and there's also an upper level causal arrow, but what you can do is that you say, well, listen, if this system was gonna go into P2 anyways, like it didn't need M1, we didn't even need to describe it in terms of M1, we can just throw out M1. To be honest, like maybe it's useful, but it's not kind of really real. Um, so this obviously causes a lot of consternation because it basically says that nothing in the reality is real except for subatomic physics, and that's a problem, you know, for you, who's made up of subatomic physics, right? Because then you can just kind of cancel out you as well. Um, you know, philosophers are very freaked out by that, uh, obviously. And they can figure out a way out of that. They say, okay, but this is a pretty ironclad argument. So there are a lot of you know, historical notions of this, so, so, so forgive this quote, but this is a quote by here Simon Laplace, and I think that it kind of sums up this intuition or why we have this drive for this reductive instinct very well, and it's that we may regard the present state of the universe as the effect of its past and the cause of its future, and intellect which at any given moment you all the forces that animate nature and the mutual positions of the beings that compose it, if this intellect were vast enough to submit the data to analysis, could condense into a single formula the movement of the greatest body of the universe and that of the lightest atom, the possession of that nothing will be uncertain, and the future, just like the past, will be present before its eyes. This appears on the class is very fancy. And here's um, a different man looking much more unsure, and this is Borges. And uh, Borges was a short story and essay writer, and he wrote a, a work called On Exactitude in Science. And he gives kind of a thought experiment that's almost like a reply to Laplace, right? So in that empire, the art of cartography attained such perfection that the map of a single province occupied the entirety of a city, and the map of the empire the entirety of a province. In, those in time, those unconsciousable maps no longer satisfied, the cartographer's guild struck a map of the empire whose size was that of the empire itself, and which coincided point for point with it. In the following generations, who were not so fond of the study of cartography, uh, they saw that the vast map was useless, and not without some pitilessness to it, and they delivered it up to the infancies of the sun. So I think he's, he's, he's getting at some kind of maybe uh, contradictory intuition, which is that, okay, it doesn't really make sense to always build the best possible model of any system that you can. That you can. Or by best possible, I mean the fine, most fine grain and precise representation, right? Okay, so let's say we want to pit these two, uh, these two kind of figures against one another. So this is a, this is a, fame, uh, a scene from a, from a very famous movie um, in which uh, the the knight here is playing chess with death, and but instead of death, there's no good images of people playing games with demons, so I have this. But they're going to play a game against Laplace's demon. So you can say, okay, well, Laplace's demon, Laplace said that the demon knows everything, so let's try to think of some sort of game wherein 
the demon loses, strangely. Uh, strange enough. So, okay, so let's bet against the boss's demon. Okay, so the demonic bet. Okay. So, I, the boss of demon comes to me and says, you know, I know everything, I'll play any game that you want. And I say, okay, that's, that's fine, the boss of demon, here are some rules of the game. And we could, of course, play with the entire state of the universe itself, but that's, that's impossible. Let's just simplify it and talk about distinct systems. And the game is, is that you're going to try to guess the future outcome, the future state of a particular system, given you putting that system into a particular state, some random state. Right? And these could be really simple systems. It could be systems with four states. It doesn't need to be the whole universe. It could be something very really simple. And, okay, so what should we bet? Well, how about you're rewarded in terms of the number of possible outcomes? Um, say, the log of the number of outcomes. And that's because, of course, if there are more possible states, it's much harder to guess the future, right? If there's only two states, it's much easier to guess. If there's 100 states, it's harder to guess. So you should get more money if you guess correctly uh, for the 100 states. And then you should also kind of be rewarded uh, in proportion to whether you actually produce the state that you guessed was going to be produced. Um, so it kind of has to incorporate the base likelihood that that state would have happened regardless of what uh, state you put the, the system in. So here's like a really, really simple example. So here's a system with deterministic outcomes, and you're at some time t, and you're in some state at uh, SX, and you're going, it's going to transition to some state in the future. And let's say you guess that it's going to transition to S2. And in fact, if you look at the transition probabilities of that system, you find it's like 100% chance. So, okay, so how much money are you going to make? Well, a nice a mathematical formalization of this is that your reward should be the log of how much of this probability over the probability of S2 happening without SX, right? So in this case, when you do that out for this system, you have a 100% probability of getting your guess correct, and your state is the only state that leads to the S2, so you're going to get $2 because let's say there's only four possible outcomes for this system. So, so you have this some kind of reward function. It seems relatively sensible. Let me give another example of why it might seem sensible. Here's a system, again, just kind of a made-up, small, random system, but it only has one outcome. So no matter what, what you do, what state the system's placed in, it automatically goes to S1, no matter what, in the future. And so that means that um, you can put it in any state, and you'll always be correct that it's, that it's S1. So you putting it in a state didn't matter at all. Um, so therefore, you shouldn't be able to make a bunch of money off this system. This doesn't really prove you know how to manipulate the system. It doesn't prove anything about it, because it always goes to S1. So, then you'll get $0 for, for this system, no matter kind of what you bet. And then if you have a system with totally random outcomes, you'll also get $0. So this is like a way to say, okay, well, we want it to be such that you're just demonstrating that you have the knowledge that you can intervene on systems in such a way that you can produce some state, um, and that it's not just going to be random or just go to one, one possible outcome. Okay, so then we say, okay, let, let's play with bosses. With bosses. Okay, so then we can get into some interesting situations. So what about a system with, with convergent outcomes? So that means that one state, you put it in some state, and it can go to multiple states, right? So here's a really simple example. S2, I put the system in S2, and it can go to S1, S2, S3 in the future, and it's actually just indeterminate. It could go to any of those three states. And when you calculate out how much, uh, how much money you should expect to kind of make by putting the system in S2, you should make about 14 cents because it's very unsure. And, um, and then you say, okay, with Plastic Demon, you made your 14 cents off of this bet. And you can say, well, I'm going to do something that's a little bit maybe cheating, but you didn't specify the rules. And that's that I'm going to say, well, what do you mean by state? Because you were saying that S2 is a particular state, and S1 is a state, and S2 and S3, and so on. So what if I just say that S1 S2 and S3 are all just one state. Like, I don't care that these are separate things. They're all, they all come from S2. Like, I'm just going to call them one particular state. So I do that, and then in this particular example, I say, well, I put it into, you know, a particular state, and it leads with 100% probability to, let's just call them all state A, right? Now, of course, when I've done this, I've reduced the number of possible outcomes in the system, right? Which we know that you should make less money off of your bet, because now 
you know, you might think, well, you're shooting yourself in the foot, right? Because you started with four different things. That means you can make, you know, it's the log of four. That's going to be kind of the upper limit on the amount of money that you can make. And here, you can only make the log of two. So you can only make a dollar, like maximum, right? It's like, yeah, I can make a dollar, but I'll make it more often. So then you can ask, okay, well, what if I took some system that has some of this indeterminacy, and then I look at the expected value of the bets? So if you look at it and you treat the system as if it's composed of four different states, and those four different states have these transition probabilities, such that, for example, S4 always goes to S4, that's great. Uh, you'll make a lot of money off of that state. But for these other states, you'll be very unsure about what the future state of the system is going to be, and so you'll make very little money. So if you look at the expected value of the bets, you'll make only about 60, 60 cents, right, over time. Um, or on average, you'll make about 60 cents. So then you take the same system, and I say, well, I'm just going to do the same thing. I'm going to call all this SA, no matter what, and I just see, well, it always deterministically leads to SA, and now my expected value of my, my betting game is a dollar. So I'm making 40 more cents here, and um, then someone who, for example, like the Plaza Demon, who just wants to always take the system and model it in the most precise possible way possible. And the point is not so much that this is somehow a, a really amazing game. The, the point is that the conditional probabilities of the system change depending on how you describe it. So when you say, well, I place it in one of these states, and then it's going to transition to another state, it's like, well, I've moved from this indeterministic uh, transition to a, a deterministic one in this case. And actually, this kind of model is going to eventually have a lot to say about causation, causal relationships, and information. So this is like a, an interesting example of maybe an argument about, okay, well, maybe there are some, some kind of games that we can beat Laplace's demon at if we're clever and we start moving states in a particular way. You say, well, that's an interesting argument. But um, the problem with arguments um, is that they're, they're often binary and they're contentious, right? So are you coming to bed? I can't. This is important. What? Someone is wrong on the internet. You need to pound your, your keyboard. You're very angry. Um, and the pro to an argument is that you often will answer in the original question if people are arguing in, in fair, fair faith. But the con is that it's often binary. So it's just a philosophy conference, which I don't normally go to, and um, you know, it's very, very binary. So they don't, for, so for example, they'll be like, do we have free will or don't we? And then I'm kind of like, well, what do you mean? And what are the mechanisms by which you think that that might work? And they say, it doesn't matter. It's just yes or no. Do you think we're going to? Right? Are you a materialist or are you a realist? Right. Um, so the nice thing about a theory is that you establish a toolkit, and you don't the problem is that you don't always answer the original question, but sometimes you realize that the original question wasn't exactly the correct question. Maybe there's a more interesting question that the theory answers. So I'm going to try to have a, present to you like a theory that tries to deal with this uh, Borges versus Laplace kind of issue and this issue of scale and, and, uh, and scientific theories. So another really simple reason would be that if you were making an argument, there's branching structure. So, you know, I say this, and then you counter with, I'd say X, you counter with Y, and then we keep going until one of us is convinced. And the problem is that you created a branching structure, and you're all network theorists. So, you know, a branching structure is really highly unstable, so it's totally dependent on this initial condition, right? Like, what route I take will determine where I end up in this long uh, line, whereas a theory is going to be more stable because it's coherent, um, and every part, like, reinforces the other part. So this is just an example of why I'm not just immediately making some sort of argument. I'm going to take on a bit of a... Of a, of a longer road. And, okay, so let's say we want to have some sort of theory that can, that can differentiate at, uh, between uh, which scale, uh, which model is going to be the most informative. So, so, okay, so how do we assess a system at a higher scale? Like, I just gave you a really simple example. It seems like we can just group stuff. That seems like a, maybe kind of a viable higher, higher scale. We all know that there's kind of higher scale than biological systems. We had these flip books. Uh, or at least I had a lot of these flip books when you were a kid where you start with the muscles and you go to the brain and so on all the way down, right? A lot of systems can kind of be described like that. One example would be a computer, right? Because a computer, you can describe it in terms of very distinct and, and definite forms of languages, right? So at the high level, you have maybe your C, you've got some high-level programming language, but then that's going to be, um, but underneath that is going to be some assembly language, some machine language, and then all the way down to, say, the actual hardware of the computer, right? And all those seem like 
from a viable definite form of description. To give another example of when you might think of things at a higher scale, uh, here's um, a really famous painting, which is a pointless. So if you go in very close to this image, um, everything kind of loses its focus, loses its coherency. You're not even sure what you're looking at. You have to step out about 10 paces before what you're seeing pops into focus. Um, so what would be an example of this in science? Well, a, a really simple example would be something like a macro state. So if scientists talk about macro states, they talk about something like temperature. Right? So temperature is uh, if I have these particles and they're bouncing around, they're going a certain uh, velocity or, or direction. The, you know, one of the, the canonical examples of why it's a macro state is because, listen, if I take two of these particles, A and B, and I switch their identity such that now A is traveling the way that B was and B is traveling the way that A was, it doesn't affect the macro state at all. So the macro state is invariant under changes of the micro state. Right, so that's one of the definitive properties of being a macro state. That seems like a good, a good place to start. Another example is if you look at um, neural spiking, there's a very common technique used in neuroscience called the local field potential, which is essentially a sum over all these neurons that are firing. So here's an example of all these dots and neurons firing. This is time, and you can see as the neurons fire, you get this very nice oscillatory behavior. And neuroscientists, of course, treat this very much like a macro state. So I think that there's kind of an obvious place to start as a first definition, and that would be something like coarse grain. So really, a simple example would be I take some system, maybe it's, it's formed of elements and has all sorts of connections between them, and I start grouping over the states, right? So I say, well, A and C, maybe let's call that alpha, right? And then let's call these two things beta, let's call this gamma, and so on. And I can kind of coarse grain over steps all the way up until almost everything is grouped together. So obviously, you can kind of go across levels in terms of coarse grain, too. So let's say we want to define that formally, right? So we can play around with this in simple systems. So coarse grains, what are they? They're mappings over elements and states. So for example, probably, probably most of you here are familiar with something like a Markov process or something like a network of logic gates, right? So you can even just think of these as networks with simple update rules, right? So here's a really simple network, A, B, C, D, and it has some connections between them, and it all has some update rule, but we don't need to define that for a coarse grain. But we can say, well, listen, what, what is a coarse grain? A coarse grain is when we say that, well, A and B aren't really two separate things. Really, they kind of are just one big thing, and let's just call that, call that alpha. And we can construct that big thing that we just call alpha via some mapping. So here is an element mapping, A and B map to alpha. And then let's say that maybe these are binary nodes in a network, so they can be either be on or off, 0 or 1. And then we can construct a, a congruent state mapping, right? Such that, well, if I look in at A and B states, I can take A and B states 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and map all that to off. And I'll take 1, 1, and I'll map that to on. And so now I might say, if I saw that A and B were 0, 1, I would just say, OK, alpha's off. Right. So you have, and then there are kind of sensible mapping rules. Like, for example, for it to be a macro level description, it always has to have fewer elements and states. So if I just take A and B and I just start calling, let's call this I and J and K or whatever, um, then I just re it in a different language, but I haven't condensed my description, so I don't really have a macro level. And you kind of have to say, well, there's not really any micro level information at the macro level. So if you just tell me alpha off, I don't know if, if A was 0 or 1. Right? So I've lost some sort of information. So you have to have fewer elements and states. And kind of more generally, you have to lose some sort of information. Um, otherwise, you're not really going up to a kind of. So that's what a coarse grain might look like formally. But of course, there might be all sorts of other kind of higher scales. And they're all basically, mathematically, they're all just kind of dimensionality reduction. So here would be an example of what I would consider a higher scale um, would be something like, well, let's say I, I leave a state out of my system. right? So I, I, just, I can't even see this state. Or I might leave an element out, right? So if I go like this, okay, well, now I've kind of left an element out of it. I've left an exogenous or a coarse grain, as we said. But you could also do something like black boxing, which would be that you don't pay any attention to anything but the input and the output structure. That's also kind of moving up to this higher scale. You could set an initial state. You could set certain background conditions. All of these involve basically taking out something of the array of options or dimensionally reducing the system. Um, OK, so we have kind of a, a general idea of how we might um, coarse grain a system and, and how we might find some sort of mapping so that we can get a higher scale out of a lower one. So how do we 
So, so now we were saying that this micro assumption relied on this notion, two, two, two big kind of notions fundamentally. One is what's doing what. So for example, okay, all, all the atoms in the system are doing something. Okay, well that's, ca that's causation. That's something like causal work. Or you might talk about information. So the boss of demon has all the information. So that means that, well, we should talk about information and causation. We should actually maybe assess these things because maybe that's what we mean by best possible model. We mean the model with the most causal structure or information about causal structure or the most information. So there's a really interesting uh, connection between information and causation, between these two things that underlie this, this, this reductive assumption. So first is, is in dealing with notions of causation. So causation recently has kind of been through a renaissance. It wasn't really a scientific topic until maybe the, the, the even 80s and 90s. Um, Judea Pearl uh, developed a really useful thing called the interventionist framework, which basically means that if I had some model of a system, I can figure out its stuff about its causal structure by going in and intervening on parts of it and seeing what happens. So an example would be here's a really simple system about sprinklers and whether my lawn is wet and it turns out that if I turn my sprinkler on, do you know sprinkler, then the lawn will be wet. Um, very simple, but it turns out to be very powerful. But interestingly, causation has also been thought about in terms of something called the counterfactual. So if not x, then not y, right? So that's very interesting because that means that so when something has a causal relationship, uh, that causal relationship is based on things not happening, like not x, then not y. I think information is almost identical. So information, let's say I flip a coin and I get a heads. So everyone will tell you, well, you just kind of generated one bit of information, or one bit of information describes what just happened. Um, so why is it one bit? If I roll a die and I get a one, right, I'm going to get some larger number of bits. Why is that? Well, because each of those things ruled out a different number of things that didn't happen. So by heads, I rule out of tails. By getting a one on a die, I rule out a two, three, four, five, and six. So it generates more information. But those things never happened. They were just sets of, of, of counterfactuals. Right? Um, so okay, so there, there seems like there might be some sort of connection between these two things. And now we can start thinking about things that are more maybe causal, and maybe might pertain more to causal relationships, which are things like dependency, coupling, constraint, there's various ways that people say the word causal structure, causal relationship. Most are pretty much synonyms. Uh, control is another one. But here's an example from information theory that seems to capture something very similar, which is mutual information, which is how much information does two variables, x and y, share. And we'll, we'll, we'll get to this, but basically you can start thinking about something like, well, what if I measured the information between my interventions and the effects my interventions had? Right? And that would give me some sort of bit measure for how much I was able to causally perturb this system or how much of an effect my perturbations on the system had, something like that. So I'm going to take you through how to measure um, a formal metric called effective information that I think captures all these things and kind of combines them into something that we can then apply to simple systems. And here's an example of this. So Effective information. So let's measure it on a really simple system again. This is like those simple games uh, that we were playing with the boss's demon. So if I have two elements, A and B, and let's say that they're copies. And what does that mean? Well, it means that they just copy each other's state. So if A sees that B was on, then A will turn on. And if A sees that B was off, then A will turn off. It's always up to the next time step, and these are simple things just updating their rules. And from this, we can construct something called the transition probability matrix. And what that is, is that if you take the system as a whole, what state is it going to transition into next, given the state that it's currently in? So for example, if both A and B are off, it will be off in the next time step with 100% probability. So I write a 1 in here, and so on. And we can imagine that it's in some particular state. So let's say it's both in, it's in 1, 1. So if it's, if it's on, on, then it will definitely be on, on in the next time step. And in fact, you can also predict the past from that. You can do retrograde. So, so you say, well, so it, it must have been 1-1 one, one in the past as well. So from this, we can kind of think of this, the TPM, as basically a causal map. Because what does it say? It says that if I have 0-0, zero, zero, I always go to 0-0. Zero, zero. If I have 0-1, I go to 1-0. If I have 1-1, one, one, I always go to 1-1, one, one, and so on. So in some sense, then, what's going on is that when the system's in a state, it specifies something about its future. 
So this mechanism, these two copy gates, they specify the future, right? And they specify it out of the repertoire of all possible futures that this system could be in. So here is an example of this. So let's say that the state is in 1, 1. So here is the distribution of what the future is going to look like given that the state is in 1, 1, the conditional future. So this is the future given that we know that it's in state 1, 1, and that's 100% it's going to stay in 1, 1. And then what we can do is we can say, OK, so how much kind of information is associated with, the, with that specification of the future? It's specifying something out of many objects. So that's information. Well, you can say, well, what happens to the future if we don't know what state the system is in? What if we were in that position? Because that's basically how much information, the difference between these two is, it is how much information about the future of this particular state is kind of generating or how much it has. And here would be a maximum entropy distribution for all possible, uh, any possible state could happen, right? And then you can take this distance using something called a relative entropy. Entropy being probably the most fundamental measure of information theory. And you can take this relative entropy between the future conditional on one state and the future conditional on all possible states. This is what the formula for relative entropy is. I'm not going to go too much into it, but you can just think about it as a difference metric. So you're like asking, how much information does this state generate by how much of a difference does it make to the future? So again, if I know the state, what do I expect? This. If I don't know the state, what would be my best guess? Right? Well, it would be this. And then the difference between those is how much information you have by getting that state. Okay, so this is kind of an interesting way of phrasing it, but let's connect it more firmly to causation because what we can say is that, okay, well, this is basically saying how much information is generated when I intervene to put the system in a state. So, if I again go back to this really simple system and I have, say, I perform what's called this do operator, which is a big part of causal analysis now. So I put A into a state, which is maybe one, and I put B into a state, which is maybe two. Then I get my transition probability matrix. Now uh, probabilities are represented in grayscale, so black is 100% probability, so 0, 0 is 100% transition to 0, 0. I get my transition probability matrix. But what you can think of is how would you generate this? Well, you would perturb the system for all possible states, right? This is like the fundamentals of induction, right? If I don't know how something works, I take some handle on it, you know, and I start messing around with it, right? And then eventually through induction, I'll kind of figure out how it's going to work, so I'll figure out its transitions. And we can think about that in the way that I was talking about in terms of the information. So we can think about it in terms of the, the prediction that this generates. So if I put it in state, say, off, off now, how much information will that generate? Well, I have some distribution of what I expect given my intervention to off, off. And I even have, if the system's in a particular state, I might say, well, what information, what intervention put me there? And if I was in off, off, I might also guess, well, Someone must have put me in off off, right? And in both cases, I can put a bit value to that. And then to kind of more formally connect them, you can say, well, let's assume that there's kind of a distribution of interventions that I'm doing on the system. And that's like intervening on the system to put it into all the possible states, uh, equally probably. And then when I have, so when I have this intervention distribution, and then I have an effect distribution, which is what's happening to the system as I'm putting it into all these different states. And then I can take the mutual information between these two. And that's going to be the same as this effective information. So this is the same thing. It's just a different mathematical way of stating it that connects it directly to causal structure. And notice that this it's important that it's, you're talking about the maximum entropy of, uh, over the intervention because not all interventions reveal or specify something about the causal structure. Here's a really simple example, let's say I have a light switch and a light bulb, right? And I want to understand the causal structure. Well, let's say I just put the switch into up, and I never turn it off. I just leave it up so that it's up. So I have no idea what the causal relationship between light switch and light bulb is, because I've just put it into one state. So to do like good analysis of causal structure with interventions, you need to vary your intervention. OK, so okay, uh, you can kind of see this, what, what, this has some sort of connection to causation. But again, let's make it more explicit. We have our connection to information, which is the connection to the mutual information. Now let's connect it further to causation. So imagine that I have two different systems. One system is like causally perfect. And what that means is that given any state of that system, 
the past state is always obvious and the future state is always obvious. That is, the future, the future is always determined given the current state and the past is always determined. And we call these, these two values degeneracy and determinant. So for example, here is a system uh, where we're at least this transition where the degeneracy is zero. So you know exactly where it came from. And if the degeneracy were one, it would mean it could have come from any state, you have no idea. And then the system has determinism one, which means that there's no noise. So if it's in one particular state, it's always going to go to some particular state in the future. And then you can compare that to like kind of the worst imaginable system, right? Which is that everything is just random. You're given a state of the system, it could have come from any other state, and it could go to any other state. Right, so in that case, you would have degeneracy of one and determinism of zero, right? And these are important kind of causal properties. Why? Because they're just restatements of something people who've talked about causation have talked about for about a thousand years, which is sufficiency and necessity. So here is in this system, this is perfectly sufficient. This the one one is perfectly necessary to produce one one, and it's perfectly sufficient to produce one one as well. Here, no state is necessary to produce one one, and one one is probabilistically equally likely to produce any state, which is like saying it's basically unneeded for any particular state. It's not really sufficient to produce states, it just produces them randomly. And uh, this is an interesting connection because basically necessity is noise and sufficiency is noise. They're just going different directions in time. So if something's unnecessary, then it's just noise in the past, and if something's not really sufficient, then it's just noise in the future. So, and noise is really fundamental in information theory. Okay, so why did I introduce these? Well, because effective information also captures those properties, and so it's basically a bit value that captures these essential properties, and the way to get those to those properties is just to take the effective information and divide it, and divide it by how big the system is. So here, for example, is a system with effective information of two bits. This is a Markov chain, so it's just a set of state transitions. And you can see it just translates around like this. And when you calculate it out, you can give it some sort of effectiveness, or um, uh, which is basically just the determinism mixed with the degeneracy. So here's the effectiveness of one. That means it's perfectly deterministic, and there's no degeneracy in the system. Here's an example where there's some degeneracy and some indeterminism. And here's an example where it's just totally random, um, and it has absolute degeneracy and absolute indeterminism. And then, as we pointed out before, you can think of this intervention distribution as representing um, this modeler's interaction with the system. So again, we have these same systems, but now I can think about it as I apply some intervention distribution to put this system in random states, and then I observe what happens in terms of the transitions, right? So here would be an example of I do this particular state with um, equally probably to any other state, and you can use that to either derive the TPM or you can use it to directly calculate the effective information. Okay, so we have some way of comparing scales, some way of talking about information and causation. So how do we actually do that? How do we compare the scales? So the way that we do that is that we take some system like A, B, C, and D, and we define it, and we give it some mechanisms, right? And again, this is the Markov system, so let's not worry about time right now. And we might say that these A, B, C, and D are essentially noisy AND gates, right? So they're just a network composed of noisy AND gates. They have this connection. You can go through and apply an intervention distribution to generate a probability matrix if you would like. And here's what the transition probability matrix looks like. And you'll notice, of course, that it's blurred, right? I mean, the actual values are not here, but this is grayscale. But essentially, the probabilities, the conditional probabilities, are smeared all over the system. And what that does is that it gives you a low effective information because no state particularly matters to the future of that system, right? Or at least it doesn't matter very much. 1.15 bits is the final value of that. That's also saying that this system is pretty indeterministic and there's a lot of degeneracy in it, right? So now we can go back to how we formally define scales and we can say, well, let's try coarse graining this. And the simplest thing is that first, let's just try coarse graining it in all possible ways. And now we don't miss anything. Right, so now we just do all possible coarse grains in this very simple system. And here's an example of one, one coarse grain. In fact, it turns out to essentially be the best coarse grain. And that's a coarse grain that effectively groups A and B together into alpha, and C and D together into alpha. And in fact, the states have the same state mapping that I showed earlier of 0, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 0, onto alpha being off. 
And when you do that, you essentially get something that looks pretty much like a copy gate. And when you look at the transition probability matrix of this macro scale, what you see is, of course, a much smaller matrix. That means there's much less states. And since effective information depends on how many states you have, you might think that the value would be going down. And that's true to a particular degree. But what's also true is that what you've done is that you've totally cleared up your TPM. So now the transition probability matrix is super clear. Right? You're like, oh, well, if I'm in this state, I'm 100% going to go to this state. And if I'm in this state, I'm, this is pretty much most likely the state that I came from, and, and so on. So you can make all these judgments about the state transitions that you couldn't really make before. And so you actually end up gaining information, despite the fact that your state space has gotten smaller. And the amount of information that you gain uh, can be measured as just the difference between these. So we can define something like the emergence of some higher scale causal structure which has some sort of information that's irreducible to the lower scale causal structure as, uh, as uh, this effective information minus this, which is here 0 0.4 bits. Okay, so again, so exactly how did that just happen? Okay, so we can start by defining some kind of macro level, just causal like territory. Like this is the finest grain description of this simple system that we just saw, this one here. And we can say, okay, so for any particular state, I've got, say, 0, 0, 0, 0. That might go to some you know, relatively random state. There's definitely some order here, right? It's not random. Uh, it seems grayscale in terms of the probability. Uh, but pretty much you can see that it's kind of a mess, even when you, when you organize it. And then we define some mapping. So this is the transitions of the states. This is a mapping that you define, which maps those microstates onto some macro scale description. Right here would be maps these states into this macro state, these states, these three macro states into this macro state, and so on. And what you derive is this macro level causal map of the original system. And again, all you've done is move from this system to this system, even though, of course, they're the same system. So just a redescription. And this turns out to be much better. I mean, even if you just measure like traditional properties like necessity and sufficiency of causal relationships and stuff like that, it's better. If you measure the effective information, it's better. And OK, so again, kind of how can this happen? Well, as I was saying, it has essentially two components, which is this effectiveness, which is kind of like the determinism combined with the degeneracy. So it's just how much noise, or rather, how much lack of noise there is. And then how big is the state space in the system? That's essentially all information theory. By the way. It's just, is there noise? How much noise? How big is the set of options? That's, that's like all information theory. I think it's essentially all causation as well. So when you, when you draw it out like this, you can say, well, at the micro scale, you have some big advantage in terms of size, and then I move up to the macro scale, and I'm losing this advantage, but my lack of noise variable might be increasing as I move up, and this can actually outweigh, the gain of information from this arrow can outweigh the loss of information in this arrow. So you might think, okay, this is all about noise, you're just messing around with indeterministic systems. Okay, well, what about causal emergence in a deterministic system? So here's a simple example. Here's uh, a, 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 basically a chain of AND gates, right? And the chain of AND gates is perfectly deterministic. So here's the TPM, there's no gray in this, right? Every state deterministically transitions to another state, right? And it generates 2.43 bits of effective information, and then you can, again, do all possible mappings, and you can find some coarse grain such that, well, let's just treat these AND gates like they're copies, and now you have this nice chain of copy gates. And actually, I can have greater effective information. And that's because, again, we're talking about noise both in the past and in the future, right? So this system had noise in the past. So the traditional notion of this only works in deterministic systems, it can work, sorry, this only works in indeterministic systems, yes, but almost everything that's not causally perfect qualifies as, a, as an indeterministic system. So here's an example. I won't walk you through this one, but just so that if you believe me, here's an example of, uh, of causal emergence in something that looks a little bit more like the brain. Oh, sorry, look at all of the brain. But it looks a little bit more like maybe these, like, these mechanisms look kind of like neurons. So you have some update rules at the local level for these small micro, this at the down at this micro scale of these nine elements. This actually occurs over time as well. So these elements like need the element they're connected to, to fire for a little bit before they turn on. So now we're course grinding both in space and in time. And the point being is that it actually turns out the effective information is quite low down there, and you can get very high values 
of causal emergence. So here, the causal emergence is something around three bits of extra information. Like, that's a lot of bits. Um, it's you know six times the amount of information that you had down at this micro scale. And you can do that by playing around these various these various rules. My point of view being is that you can scale this up and you can do this with bigger things. You can also search for causal emergence by checking all possible scales, not just in coarse frames. So again, I'm not going to walk through exactly what's going on here, but here's an example of when you include all the elements in your model. And here's an example when you basically just set a background condition. So imagine that I'm going to describe this system and I say, well, I'm just going to leave out D. Like, I don't care about D. Uh, I don't want to see D. I don't want to look at D. I don't want to intervene on D. I hate D. We leave D out. And that's going to, of course, reduce the dimensionality of your system. But it's also going to increase the effective information. Um, by here by a half a, by half a bit, just by leaving out a, a, a note now. It might seem really weird, like I'm throwing out information. And so here's another example where you're doing something like that, but you're black boxing, which essentially means that you you're still letting the other the other aspect of your system impact that part of the system and so on. So you can do this these various kind of tricks uh, to get to, to get this information. It doesn't just have to be coarse frames, it can be more complicated forms of what we mean by dimensionality reduction. But they all involve, as you can see, some sort of change to the model of the system, and they all involve some sort of reduced state space. So you might be questioning, okay, so why does this work? This seems crazy. Uh, how are you getting information from nothing? Um, you're throwing out information, obviously. Um, well, there's a few ways to explain how it works. Um, some people really like the description in terms of the effectiveness, in terms of the uh, determinism and degeneracy. That makes a lot of sense to people. But if you're asking on like a deep mathematical level why this works in terms of information theory, you can give this by saying, okay, what, what Shannon said was that you can think of uh, information as being transmitted along some channel. So, um, and that channel is defined essentially the same way that we've been defining the transition probability vector. Like, there's no difference between the way that Shannon talked about information channel and the way that I've been talking about cost structure. They're the exact same thing that right? So then, we say, well, uh, now we're talking about the mutual information between a set of interventions and their effects, right? Well, now we can say that, well, essentially what we're doing is that we're intervening on the system, and those are my interventions, and it's like I'm inputting them into the channel, and then that makes some decisions and transmits it, and so you can say that causal structure is essentially a channel transmitting the past into the future. And you can input a set of interventions and you can get out of the future, and there'll be some information value between those two things. And what Shannon showed was that despite having a noisy channel, there's something called the noisy uh, channel coding theorem, which is that you can have a really noisy channel, and if you code your input correctly, you can transmit more information than it at first seems like you should be able to give in that channel. Um, so here's your input x into the channel and your output y. You basically show where you can maximize like, this relationship between x and y by changing your input to the channel. And I think that that's basically what you're going, you're doing when you're encoding the causal structure of a micro scale into this causal structure of a macro scale. Because you're changing how you intervene on and observe the system. For example, if you leave a state out. If I leave a state out, like here, I just left this state out. Well, that means that my input probability, my input probability x for this state, d, is now zero. Right? And I don't, I'm not observing it either, so that means that at y, it's also zero. So I'm manipulating how I'm using the channel by changing my model of the system. Uh, this is a more... Uh, complicated example of exactly how this works, but here's a system where you're doing all sorts of different scales. So you're coarse graining, you're throwing out states, you're leaving things black box, you're doing all these different things. And what you'll notice is, is that when you start down, and sorry, this is like totally impossible to see, but if you start down at your microscope causal model, you ask what intervention, what interventions am I doing to understand the causal structure of the system while well, I'm putting it in all sorts of different states, including all the micro states. So I have this nice flat distribution. And then I start black boxing it, and my distribution warps, and then I do both black box, and I set a particular initial state, and then I coarse grain it, and so on. And eventually I start moving towards what's called uh, uh, the maximum uh, information input. So it's the code that maximizes uh, the amount of mutual information in the channel, and that's called the channel capacity. 
So I think essentially all systems have something like a causal capacity, and when you change how you describe the system and how you intervene on it and interact with it, you can use more or less of that causal capacity until you begin approaching the upper limit. Okay, so maybe we can go back to some really simple um, uh, stuff that, uh, that philosophers have talked about, like these simple examples and see, okay, given we have this very complicated, somewhat complicated uh, way of dealing with this now, let's go back to this. So now we can say, Okay, so they have some system, we have some microscale, let's say that it has, we can put a value on this arrow, right, let's say it's 0.5 bits, and then we can go up to the macro scale, we put a value on this arrow, and it's 3 bits, and we haven't changed anything about the system, but now it seems completely absurd to throw out these 3 bits. It's like, you're, you're doing something wrong, right, like, if we, this, these 0.5 bits do not incorporate these 3 bits, but you have to... Uh, you have to move up to the system to get uh, move up in scale to get these three bits. So supervenous can hold despite uh, what philosophers might call causal power being distributed at different scales of the system. So hey, that's great. Maybe you actually matter uh, to the world, and you can actually influence things if you have some form of extra causal power above and beyond like your atom. So maybe you can make maybe this doesn't really make any sense anymore uh, given a, a more coherent theory of this stuff, but. But, but here's the thing, but you, the question is, so what, right? I mean, that, that's like a very philosophical conclusion. I'm actually not super interested in it. Here's something that I'm more interested in, which is that intervention distributions are essentially experiments. So again, like I said, if you want to understand how a light switch and a light bulb are connected, go up to the light switch and you wiggle it back and forth to 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, and you'll see the light blinking, and you'll say, oh, okay, there's a causal connection here. So it's essentially an experiment, right? You can also think about it as literally a randomized trial. It's what we do in science all the time. It's the number one way to distinguish between correlation and causation is you do a randomized trial. You put the system into different random states and you observe what happens. Okay? So now if we think about that, okay, so I have some randomized trial that I'm going to do over a population of people, right? I do some intervention and some control. Well, so they're both really kind of interventions in a sense. And then I measure the difference between these two. And I know that that difference is real because I did 50-50 this way, 50-50, 50-50 in terms of the split. But here's the thing, randomized control trials at one scale, scale of people, are not random at another scale. So randomizing at some scales gives you more information than randomizing at other scales. That's, this, that's the takeaway for, for uh, that's the takeaway for this, right? Is that, listen, if I, if I inject uh, if I take this intervention distribution and I inject it at max dimension over here, I'll get 1.15 bits. But if I do it over here, I get 1.55 bits. So injecting noise, which is doing a randomized trial, is can be greater, can give you more information at a macro scale. So now, if you think about science, um, well, it makes sense that you want to maximize the amount of information you derive from your randomized control trials. Like even Laplace's demon will want to maximize the amount of information I get from randomized controlled trials. Okay, so maybe what science is kind of maybe doing is that it searches around across different scales to find places at which it gets a lot of experimental bang for its intervention. I'm uh, sorry, a lot of informational bang for its experimental bug. And then a little bit about future research, layering. So if I have some system such that Here's a system where basically all these states are big mush, they all transition to one another, and I can have some macro state, and I can get, and this is a macro state with the highest effective information. And then I have another system that's comparatively the same, but each micro state can be differentiated a little bit. Like they each have a different effect, but also the macro state with the highest effective information is the same. And then I have another one where it seems like there's this really obvious kind of scale in between the macro state with the highest effective information and the micro state. Um, and so the question is, can you come up with a way to kind of um, distinguish between these three conditions? So here's a condition where you should definitely say, what are the relevant scales of this system? The micro scale matters. The macro scale seems like it matters. Any scale in between is, uh, I'm not getting anything out of that. Like, I, the none of these states are, are distinguishable at all, right? And then here's one where they're all actually quite distinguishable, right? So I should say the micro scale matters to a, to a much greater degree in this system than this system. And then here's one where it seems like there's this really obvious uh, scale in between where I group these three together, uh, these four together, these three together, right? So I have this nested coarse frame 
And that seems like a pretty viable description of what this system is doing as well. So can you figure out some way of potentially layering the scales in some optimized way, such that you're like optimally describing your system? You're getting the most possible information about the call structure of the system out of it at all these different spatial temporal scales. And we're almost out of time, so I'll absolutely stop there. So for further information, uh, check out the first publication on this work was uh, quantifying causal immersion shows that macro can be micro, seeing the natural kind of sciences. It's back in 2013. This is Giulio Cinoni, uh, the PI whose lab I worked in uh, when we were developing this stuff. This is Larissa Almitakis, uh, who was a postdoc that I worked closely with. We were funded by DARPA, the Templeton Foundation, an organization that I now run for the White House. And then um, a more recent work updating and making this connection to the Channel capacity is when the map spread in the territory and entropy, and there's also an, an essay from Henry called Asian Above Adam Below. And then I currently work uh, in with my guy who is Rafael Yuska in the Neurotechnology Center from the university. He's kind enough to support me while I work on stuff like this. So thank you so much for your time, everybody. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, well, so there's a topic starting in a couple minutes, but we have time for a couple questions. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so that's cool. Uh, so I like the, the framework of, of somehow the state transition thing and that then you can compute this called spraining. So what I'm wondering is for a given transition matrix in the Boolean, like in the, in the state space, underlying the dynamics of this state space, you have a Boolean network, basically. That's, or you have a good dynamics. In something. So you could describe a Boolean network, and so you have a structure of the network, you have a structure of end gates, or gates, whatever input functions. And that gives you uh, a transition matrix. Uh, the question I have is, so from a transition matrix, you can quantify exactly what is the causal emergence from it because you can find the best clustering. Yes. Uh, what is the uh, network structure and set of input functions that maximizes uh, causal emergence? Is it what is found in biological networks and neural networks? Ah, great question. Um, yes, yeah, so we're literally, uh, yeah, don't don't scoop me. Um, I'm working with with Rafael Yusna and something similar to that. In that, um, I think that there's a good argument to be made that listen, I, I, I'm nature, right? Uh, I start out and I have to evolve beings that, that that make sense in the world and that have reproducible behaviors. So that means I have to have reliable causal relationships in the systems that I'm evolving. But what am I given? I'm given essentially really crappy, super noisy Legos. Like these are Legos that are like blinking in and out of existence and can like barely, they're like ghost Legos, right? And it's like, okay, now build life, right? And it's like, well, okay, so how do I do that? Well, I start by putting a lot of them together, right? I can't just start by giving them different functions. So I have to put so many of these Legos together and I have to put them together in certain configurations. So I think essentially what, what you can, one way to think about biology and why there's so much degeneracy and noise in biology is that the causal relationships in biology aren't actually at the scale at which you think that there's all this degeneracy and noise. They're actually at this higher scale, and probably biology has had to make do with really, really crappy uh, building blocks, and so it had to do that exactly. So that's the thing that I'm not completely sure it's necessarily directed at the upper scale, in the sense that you, you have hubs in all these networks. You have scale-free networks, you have hubs, and what hubs are is basically, it's like news, it's like media sources, but it integrates everything, and you're connected to them, so you're connected to the average dynamics of the network somehow. And somehow, when your own dynamics is dependent on the, a function of all other nodes, that's done more causation because like, you have an input from all other like, uh, sources in the network that affects your dynamics. And I think this coupling, that's, like, somehow that would be the, the presence, I think, that would be a scale network that you would have, and some sort of summation or some sort of like, average over all the nodes that would be to some like, the, the, best case for emergence. Yeah, very interesting. No, I don't mean, but to answer your question very directly, we don't mathematically know exactly what, how, what networks lead to the most. I mean, you can come mm -hmm. up with example networks that lead to vast amounts, but we, we don't have a map map. Any other questions? Yes. Um, course grade in time, is that, is that like a, a knocking out stuff in a, in a time series? So it can be either because so 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 time turn does be very annoying to work with. Um, um, one of the things that you can do is that you can think about it almost like black boxing. So you're black boxing time series. So it's like the spatial equivalent of black boxing is leaving out the space of the spatial equivalent of coarse graining, like temporal coarse graining, is chunking over bits. So if I say I see you. So a really simple example would be maybe 
a neuron begins to fire, there's a thing called burst coding in the cortex where a neuron has to fire a lot before any other neurons pay attention to it. Okay, so they're using burst coding, but it doesn't really matter exactly how the neuron fires. What matters is that it fires a certain number of times in a particular time window. That would be a, a really good example of a temporal force train, right? You just say, listen, above five firings in 10 milliseconds, okay, that thing is on, right? And then and that's an example of a temporal force train. So you can do them, they're, they're more difficult to work with. How do you test your theory? In the sense of like, how do I know that this is a perfect metric? Uh, yes. That is indeed what represents this like upper level yep. information versus other information. So because it's because it's math in a particular sense, the way that you test it is that you come up with well, you do something called called, called formalizing, and you also do something where you basically prove that it's the one and only measure that captures the properties that you thought it should be sensitive to in the first place. So that's really the best way to do that. So we haven't done that. It's very difficult to do that with a lot of measures. I'm actually open to the idea that there could be a class of metrics that all capture causation information in this way. I think they'll, they'll all resemble this and act very similar. One example would be that this thing that we use called relative entropy, which is the difference between the future and then the expected futures, right? How do we capture that difference? Well, I use something called the relative entropy. There are multiple difference metrics. You can use something called the, the Wasserstein metric, right, or the Earth movers distance. That's another way to capture the difference between distributions. How do you prove is one rather than the other? Then it becomes a little bit difficult. But it will be true that for all things I think of this class, they'll all act like this. And in fact, there's another mathematical measure that's not the same as effective information, but related to it called integrated information. And I've shown in a paper that it, it scales just like this. So I'd rather think of causal emergence as as kind of a more general thing that a class of measures are going to pick out, and I, and I think that this is probably the right measure, but I have not formalized it and shown it's the only one and true valid measure, and I would be open to there being other measures that acted in similar ways but had minor differences in how they're formalized, for sure. But it's a great question. We need to do that. Thanks, Eric. Anyways, I'll be here. Come talk to me if you like. <laughs>